I'm Connor. Um, I work at a company called Fishtown Analytics. Uh, as Pete said, we're based in Philadelphia uh, in the United States. Um, so we sort of do two things. Uh, we're an analytics consultancy, uh, and we work with a lot of awesome companies around the world, uh, helping them build out their analytics discipline. Um, in addition to that, and in service of that, uh, we build a handful of open source tools, uh, most notably DBT, uh, which I'm here to talk about today. <clears throat> so I just want to say that like, we are practitioners first and foremost. Um, we do work that spans the entire data stack with our clients, uh, and from analytics to data science to data engineering. Um, we work with uh, companies of a lot of different sizes. Um, and so we uh, come to this talk and come to DBT from a very practical standpoint. Uh, this is a tool that like, we actively use. A lot of people actively use it. Um, and that's sort of how it's informed rather than you know, a, a theoretical or a more academic approach. Uh, so I want to start by asking a loaded question maybe, uh, which is what do data engineers do? Um, I think if we like all went around the room and came up with our own personal answer to this, uh, we'd come up with a lot of different answers. Um, and I like to look at this from an organization standpoint, from a, a role standpoint. So uh, organizationally, I think data engineers do two things. Uh, they fill two roles. Uh, the first is that we are shepherds. So uh, we shepherd data from point A to point B through a series of pipelines. Um, we make sure that the data actually ends up where it needs to be. Uh, second, we're librarians. So because we like write all the low level code that moves data around, uh, usually we are a really good reference for um, helping someone at our organization understand where a piece of data comes from or how an aggregation is computed or how a specific metric is computed. Um, so often we're sort of the last line of defense against you know, qu uh, questions interrogating the data for what's there. Um, and like we're engineers, we automate these things. Um, we aren't like uh, taking stacks of spreadsheets and manually copying data data over and passing that on. Uh, the point is to automate as much of this as we can. Um, but I would argue that we often don't do enough in the context of this stack. So just to illustrate that, uh, I have a quick case study here. Uh, this is from a company that I worked with uh, in 2017 for about six months. Um, they're a medium-sized hardware and software hybrid tech company. Um, so they have a lot of physical presences in major cities, um, and they also have a major software stack. Uh, the data team at that time consisted of one data engineer and one analyst uh, and their manager. Um, so this is a very small team and probably a little bit different than, uh, than you know, some uh, more of a startup environment. Um, but I think it's a representative sample because this is sort of the, the structure of the teams that we generally look at. Uh, and this is what their stack looked like. Uh, so like I said, they had physical presences in a number of major cities. Um, they had data pipelines that would take those systems. Uh, they would take the application databases uh, and the API endpoints that those systems presented. They would replicate all the data out. They do some simple transformations to get all of the data into a consistent schema across the different cities. Uh, then they would warehouse it into a very large Redshift cluster. Um, then they had some other processes that worked off of that uh, sort of like main pipe. So they read data out of the Redshift cluster, transform it, write it back in. They build views, do these sorts of things on Redshift. Um, and then finally, they use Looker as their BI tool. So their analysts ultimately just ran queries in Looker to understand what was happening with this data. Um, now, there is a pretty big problem with this in their use case, which is uh, their data engineer was responsible for this entire thing. So like every line of code that was written related to transforming uh, data in their stack or to managing any of the data in their stack was handled by their data engineer. Uh, and their analyst used Looker and understood the data really well, um, but really their role in contributing to the stack was limited to uh, ideas. So they thought of a new type of analysis that they wanted to do. Uh, for example, one of the things that they had a hard time doing at the time that we started working with them was um, getting sort of advanced retention analytics uh, on their global data set. So they really had a hard time uh, looking at retention across all of these cities. They could do it really well in an individual city, but it was hard to do it across all the cities. 
Um, so ultimately, it was just a resource problem, right? They had one data engineer whose job it was to do all of this stuff. Um, and ultimately, I think what they wanted was part to help us optimize the stack, but also to sort of free up their data engineer from um, managing all the you know, nuances of their transformations, um, from keeping the Redshift cluster running and in good health, uh, all these things, uh, to doing more like data engineering work. Um, so I think that Jeff Magnuson uh, sort of very concisely stated the problem here in a way that I really like um, by saying engineers must deploy platforms, services, abstractions, and frameworks that allow data scientists, uh, or in our case study, data analysts, to conceive of, deploy, uh, develop, and deploy their ideas with autonomy. Um, so in our case study, the data scientist could conceive of the ideas, but there really wasn't any mechanism for them to develop these ideas or actually deploy them uh, into their data stack. Uh, so this is sort of the big idea in Fishtown Analytics and behind DBT. It's what if we gave our analysts uh, first sort of their own transformation space. Uh, so they already live in the warehouse. They know how to use the warehouse. Uh, and we can sort of give them their own space to, in which to work to accomplish some of their own goals without needing to rely on the data engineers to accomplish those goals. Uh, second, we could give them a data catalog. So instead of directly answering questions, uh, we can provide a catalog of all the data that's in the warehouse, uh, and they can answer those questions for themselves. So it's really making them a lot more autonomous, saving our engineers a lot of time, um, and letting the data engineers focus on the stuff that really they can only do, uh, which is you know all the hard technical stuff and uh, you know making these stacks run uh, really smoothly and so on. Uh, so this is sort of our uh, reimagined vision of how this world looks. Um, so there's still this part that the data engineer owns where the data gets read out of the source systems, it's passed through pipelines, it's written into the raw data schemas in the warehouse. But then there's some other thing that the analysts own that the raw data passes through to put out transform data all inside the context of the warehouse, right? Because that's where they're very comfortable. Um, and finally, that transform data can feed into Looker and all these other processes that, um, that uh, we want to run. Um, so in this scenario, the data engineers are collaborating on this sort of purple area by providing the platform for these things to run on, but the analysts are actually the ones doing most of the implementation of SQL code. Um, so this is the idea behind DBT. Uh, DBT is an open source command line based transformation tool. Yeah, it's designed for all of the SQL authors at your organization. Um, so often at very small organizations, it's used by like the CEO uh, or somebody who understands SQL and really wants answers to these questions. Um, and as the organization grows, that can become a whole bunch of different people who might understand SQL. Uh, it's about two years old. We have a little over 250 weekly active projects, so it's still pretty young and uh, not that widely used. Um, but importantly, it's 100% free and open source. So from here, I'm going to kind of give you a whirlwind tour of all the functionality included in DBT. Um, you can get all of this today by just running pip install DBT, uh, or you can visit the website and learn a little bit more. Uh, so DBT is a developer tool, um, or at least it acts like one. Um, so I think a good comparison might be something like Terraform. Um, there's a command line interface that we use in a development workflow uh, to deploy data models to the warehouse. Uh, and this means that your team members, including your analysts, end up working in the terminal and in a text editor. Um, this is a little bit strange for a lot of analysts at first. Uh, it's a new set of tools. Um, but we've had a, like amazing success training analysts on how to use this stack. And we found that they're really eager to get involved with uh, managing the transformations. Um, they write SQL transformations, then they execute them using DBT, uh, then they automated test them, uh, which we'll talk about that. DBT has some automated testing functionality built into it. Um, and finally, they go through you know, QA validation deployment to production. Um, so in short, when using DBT, your analysts uh, behave like software developers. They go through the same process that software developers go through. Um, just a quick note on uh, SQL. Uh, DBT only supports SQL. It doesn't support Python. It doesn't support R. It doesn't support Scala or anything like that. Um, 
And this, in a lot of ways, is a limitation of DBT. Um, but it turns out that modern data warehouses can actually handle a lot. Um, so right now, it works with Postgres, with Redshift, uh, and with Snowflake and Google BigQuery. Um, we sort of are ready to accept more plugins to connect to more databases. And really, what we're lacking there is uh, domain expertise in these specific databases. Um, so for example, we would love to be compatible with Flink, um, but we just don't have the local domain expertise to build that thing out and do it right. Um, so if you're interested in using this and you don't see your warehouse on this list, uh, come talk to me after. We'd be happy to hear more about sort of how you can help us uh, add that to dbt. Uh, okay, so this is the um, development workflow that I described for dbt, and we're just going to walk through these steps really quickly. Uh, so first, your analysts write SQL uh, in their text editor. And, uh, the atomic unit of transformation in dbt is called a model. So the code that they're actually writing uh, is uh, represented in SQL scripts that they put into a Git repository. Um, and when dbt executes this model, each model corresponds to one object in the warehouse. So we're either building a view or a table or something else, um, but each model always has one output in the warehouse. So we kind of understand from a dbt project what the outputs are. Uh, and you can see here an example invocation. So on the command line, we can type dbt run dash dash model accounts, and that will run just the accounts model that we have defined on the right here. Uh, so I mentioned that dbt models uh, all map to one output. Uh, dbt models also define their inputs uh, through a, the use of a special Jinja function called ref. Um, so in a dbt model, you use this thing called ref, you uh, ref a table, and what that does is it builds an edge in a DAG, so dbt can represent the DAG of your entire project, um, and it also replaces that ref call with the uh, local version of your table. That sounds a little confusing, but we'll sort of dive into an example of that later on. Um, but so once dbt has that DAG, uh, it can really traverse any part of your graph in any order that you're interested in having it do so. Uh, so this is really great for development when you're just tweaking one transformation and you want to build just that transformation and all the downstream ones. Um, so this is a, an example of how we would run uh, the identity model and all of its children and all of its parents. Um, and I have some uh, more examples that we'll get into later. Um, but this is a... Uh, this is a, a screenshot of our dbt documentation tool uh, of a DAG that we built specifically for this talk. Um, and this is supposed to model uh, typical like web event data. So in dbt, uh, in your raw data schema in your warehouse, you might have a web events table and like something around page view timing. How do those events map to actual page views? And from there, we can start to build up all the constructs that your analysts actually want to analyze in the warehouse. So we can build page views. And then from there, we can sessionize those page views. And then we can map the identities in those sessions from the rest of the warehouse uh, into this local uh, web event data. And then finally, we can combine that into the like, uh, be all, end all users model that unites all these, uh, these data sources into one model. Um, this is a more realistic DAG. Uh, this is actually from our own internal project. Um, it's very common for these projects to grow to like hundreds and hundreds of models with complex DAGs. Um, I think that this is uh, interesting for a couple reasons. Uh, first, because uh, it really shows you that like there's a lot of logic that people want to express here. Um, this isn't something that ends up having you know 10 or 15 models. Um, once analysts get their hands on this, there's a lot that they want to do. There's a lot of abstractions that they want to build, and there's a lot of different ways that they want to connect data together. Uh, second, uh, you know, to the SQL warehouse's point, um, warehouses handle this kind of DAG building really well. Uh, so it turns out that you can build hundreds of tables uh, pretty effectively in some of these warehouses. Um, and many hundreds is about as far as we've gotten. We haven't gotten to the thousands yet, um, but so far, so good. So we talked about writing SQL, we talked about DAGs, now let's talk about how we actually use dbt to build out these DAGs in the warehouse. Um, so I mentioned that dbt can select different parts of the DAG to execute. Um, and here we just have a few quick examples of how you might do this, uh, how you might actually invoke dbt to make these things happen. So the first one, if we just call dbt run from any environment, it's gonna build all of the models in the entire project. 
uh, and if we provide a specific, what we call a model selection syntax, uh, we can tell it which specific models in the project to build. So we can either run one specific model, we can run a model and all of the downstream models, we can run a model and all of its inputs and so on. Um, and importantly, this works the same way everywhere. So when you run dbt in development uh, with your project code there, uh, it's gonna work exactly the same way as when you deploy this thing to production and run that code there. Um, there's no sort of like special framework that you need to run these things in production. Uh, all you do in production is the same thing you did locally. Pip install dbt, move the code over there, run dbt from production, and everything will just work. Uh, so materializations um, are a concept built into dbt that define how to actually turn one of these SQL statements into a warehouse object. And dbt has a few built in. Um, it has the basic view and table build, so we can take a select statement and then go from the select statement to like a create table as query where we just copy all of the contents of that select statement into a brand new table. Um, similar with views, we can run create view as and generate a view that can be reused. Um, maybe more interestingly is uh, something called an incremental model. Uh, so the idea of an incremental model is given an input table that has a primary key uh, and a, a destination table that we previously generated with the same primary key, we can look at an updated at field on the source table and find all the updates that need to be passed on to the destination table uh, and actually go through, do the updates, do the deletes in the destination table where necessary, um, and then append all the new records to the destination table. Um, so for like very append only data sets like uh, event streams, um, this ends up being a very efficient way to sort of pull events along in your warehouse into your final model without needing to like copy extra data over as you go. Uh, okay, so now that we've uh, written some SQL, we've actually built some models in the warehouse, we have the ability to run automated tests on them. Uh, so this is just like a good practice in software development, right? We always want automated tests to prevent bugs from hitting production. Um, it's a little weird to think about this in a data context, as I'm sure a lot of you know. Um, in a warehouse context, automated tests can usually catch things like bad calculations. Um, they're really good at catching bad joins or fan outs. They're really good at detecting schema mismatches. Um, and dbt provides this sort of functionality via tests of two different kinds. Um, so the first one and the more basic one is uh, SQL tests. So a test in dbt is a select statement that retrieves failing records from the warehouse. So any query that you can write that retrieves a list of failing records from your warehouse can be used in dbt as a test. Um, in this example, we're running this uh, query select star from accounts where ID is not null. So if there are any records where ID is null, uh, we'll get a list of those back, we'll pass those onto the test, dbt will mark that test as failed, uh, and then our test run will fail. Um, so from there, there's a more uh, sort of structured way that we can specify these tests called schema tests. Um, and these map pretty closely to like constraints in a traditional relational database system. Um, a lot of these warehouses don't come with that out of the box for a lot of really good reasons. Um, but often you want to like go back and retroactively test whether those constraints are in place without necessarily like preventing raw data from making it into the warehouse. Um, so out of the box, dbt supports uniqueness, not null, and foreign key constraints. Um, and in this schema.yaml file here on the right, if you look at this not null test here, that's exactly the same test that we were just looking at. So we're asserting that the ID field on the accounts table uh, is not null. You can also define your own custom schema tests. Uh, I won't get into that, but it's something that you can do. Um, so here's an example of how you would invoke that test. Right, uh, so we can run dbt test with the same exact model selection syntax that we use for models, uh, and it will select all the tests for those models, execute them, and hopefully they all pass. Uh, okay, so finally, we have written SQL, we've run it, we've run test, everything looks good, now we can move on to sort of validation and deployment. Uh, so the first, like, really important validation and deployment thing that dbt ships with is a documentation generator. Um, so this does a few things. It looks at all the models in your project. Uh, it looks at all the metadata provided in the schema.yaml files. Uh, finally, it actually builds a catalog of your warehouse. Um, and it uses all of this uh, information to build a like, fully materialized catalog for your warehouse that we can then use to generate a documentation website. 
Um, so this is a screenshot of what the DBT documentation website looks like. Uh, this is for this uh, test project that I was just showing you. Um, so there's a couple things that I want to point out here. Uh, first, if you look on the left here, you can see that we can navigate this site either via the structure in the database, so like all the schemas that are in the database that we care about, uh, or by the actual like structure of our DBT project. Um, contained in this documentation, uh, we're currently looking at the documentation for the sessions table. Um, and we can do things like write a description for the sessions table, uh, specify who the person is that someone should talk to, uh, if it's unclear what data is in there or if they think they found a bug in that table, um, as well as just providing like general documentation of what this thing is and what it does. Um, you can see at the bottom here too, uh, I don't have a screenshot of this, but we have a listing of all of the columns, their data types, um, as well as all of the test constraints that we've applied to those columns. So when we get to the demo, I'll show you a little bit more about that. Uh, next, we have uh, a view into the source and compiled SQL for the model. So in this sessions file, uh, this is the actual raw SQL that lives there, and you can see that there's unrendered Jinja inside this SQL. Um, when we go to actually compile this thing, you can see that um, it has replaced the config block with just nothing. It's just rendered it out. And the DBTC, uh, excuse me, the ref to page views, it's replaced with a call to the DBTC MacArthur schema, the page views table. So what's interesting about this is I'm running this in a development context right now in a brand new schema called DBTC MacArthur. Um, and everything that DBT builds and interacts with in that context is going to be isolated to that schema. So it's totally isolated from the production uh, um, transformation build that we could execute uh, that would live in a separate schema and would be totally, totally isolated from this. Uh, so next, if we click this little pop-out thing on the bottom right, we can get just like a quick view of the DAG for this specific model. Um, so here, this is just the direct parents and children. Um, so you can see that this depends on page views. Uh, and as we saw before, sessions is used to build identity and then users later on. Um, and if we go like full screen with this, uh, we can get like the full DAG of all of the SQL transformations in this project. Um, so this, the screenshot that I showed you before is just this. Uh, this is a fully interactive graph that you can use to interact with all the models that live in, uh, in your project. Uh, so I want to touch just a little bit on deployment of these things to production, and then I have a quick demo for you guys. Uh, so repeatability is a really key feature of DBT, uh, meaning that running DBT twice on the same set of inputs should always yield the same output. Uh, so that means that each user can build their own feature branches in development, they can run those things against the warehouse, build out all the models. Then they can run a continuous integration process on these, uh, do the automated tests on them, build out the development or the staging schema, then deploy to production, having all of the you know, checks that you would normally have in a continuous integration process in place. Um, so this looks just like any other software project that you would work on. Uh, our users have deployed DBT with a bunch of tools. We have a SaaS backend that we've developed called Sinter. Um, there's a bunch of cron-like uh, schedulers that people have used, so like Airflow, Kubernetes, cron. Um, a lot of people deploy with Kubernetes scheduled jobs, so they'll pack this up into a Docker container, ship it to their Kubernetes cluster, and then trigger that thing to run every hour or whenever a data load completes or you know, however they see fit to do that. Um, there's also this class of CI tools, so uh, GitLab CI, Circle CI, Travis CI, where a push to master triggers a deployment of the production models, but they can also build on pull requests and do all these other things that uh, they'll want to do. Okay, uh, so I have a quick demo uh, of everything to show you. Let's do this. Is that somewhat legible? Um, so the first thing that we're going to do here is run, uh, basically we're going to seed my test database um, with a test data set. Uh, so we can do that by running uh, this command called dbt seed. Um, and I think I need to start Docker. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, so DBT seed is a thing that we really didn't touch on at all. Um, this is sort of a useful feature for testing and that sort of thing that's built into DBT. Um, but basically the idea is it can take uh, a set of CSV files that you provide um, and build those CSV files out into actual tables in your warehouse. Um, so like in this uh, demo project where we really just want some dummy data that we can test on, um, we have the ability to just take this like realistic looking CSV file, dump it into the warehouse um, and build off of that. Um, this is often also useful for like very small test environments. So if you want a subset of your data to, uh, like you want to grab uh, 10,000 records that you then want to test in your local environment as you're developing, you can often do it using this and basically create like fixtures uh, for your project. Um, come on, Docker. All right. How about that? All right, that looks better. There we go. Okay, so you can see we took those two CSV files, we inserted the records into these tables. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, so next, we can actually run the DAG that we just showed. Um, so I'm just gonna do dbt run. And you're going to see it's going to go through and create a handful of views and then a handful of tables. Um, notably, we're only running this thing with one thread, so dbt is just going to run everything in serial order. But uh, dbt has the ability to run this with multiple threads. Uh, really, the constraint here is how much your warehouse can handle, not how much dbt can handle. Um, so if you want to run this with 30 threads and your warehouse can handle that, uh, more power to you. Um, you still have to, uh, DBT will still sort of resolve the critical path here though and always follow the DAG order when it's building these things. Uh, okay, so we built these six models. Uh, that looked pretty straightforward. Now let's build our, uh, let's run our tests. Um, so we have some tests defined for this dummy project that we're gonna run. Uh, and you can see, so we ran 14 tests and these tests are mostly of the variety that we looked at in the schema.yaml file. So they're all like testing uniqueness on the session ID field of the sessions table. Uh, or testing, uh, we can do foreign key relationships, right? So the session ID field of the page views table maps one to one with the session ID field of the sessions table. Um, now, one of these tests failed here, right? So uh, we could see at the end that uh, dbt exited with code one, which is great. Like we wanted to exit with that status when it fails. Um, and it told us a little bit about which tests failed. Um, and also, uh, Notably here, it gives us the path that it wrote the compiled SQL out to. Um, so if we just cat this file, uh, we can see here the actual query that dbt ran to run this test and you know, copy this thing out and, and run it ourselves. Uh, so finally, uh, we can run a command called dbt docs generate. Um, and this is the thing that's actually going to inspect our warehouse and build up a catalog of everything that's there. Um, now, we can actually, so you can see here it says it wrote the catalog to target catalog.json. Uh, so if we look at this file, um, you'll actually see uh, that dbt just writes out a file that has all of this information in it in a structured format in JSON. Um, so this is really like the output of dbt. Uh, dbt docs just consumes this up and gives you a website. But if you did want to wire this up more programmatically with the rest of your stack, uh, you could consume these JSON files that dbt spits out and just sort of like wire fields up that way. Um, okay, so we've generated the docs. Uh, we have this catalog file in place. Uh, finally, we can run dbt docs serve. Um, and that's just going to run a local web server that actually serves up this interactive documentation site. Um, so now, you know, we can go through and, and take a look at uh, exactly what we were just looking at before. Um, you can see we have sessions table. We have a description. Uh, we have a list of columns with the constraints specified right here and column level descriptions that we can 
sort of customize in the context of this project. Um, everything is built into a schema called DBTC MacArthur, which is what I specified for this local development run. Um, and finally, we can sort of pull out the DAG uh, and interact with that uh, dynamically as we sort of use this site. Uh, okay. Uh, so that's it. Um, thank you for listening. I'll actually leave this up here so you guys can take a look at it. Thanks to everyone for listening. Um, Hi, a great presentation and a great tool. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that you support limited number of uh, SQL uh, servers. I haven't find, found a Microsoft SQL server that uh, we use in our company all the time. Okay. So how difficult it would be to <laughs> support it? For a SQL server specifically? Yes. Yeah, so we have actually implemented uh, two other, we call them adapters, database adapters, uh, than, uh, other than the ones that I showed you. One of them was SQL Server. Um, we built a SQL Server and Azure Data Warehouse uh, support for this. And the problem that we ran into was, like I said, when we started to use it with a client, we hit a point where we basically said, like, hey, this isn't working. You should not use SQL Server. Like, we should move you to something else. Um, and so we, it was more a lack of our ability to, like, fully optimize that setup than it was that, uh, dbt could interact with that tool. Um, so anyway, we have the code ready. Um, I would love to talk to you after and maybe have you take a look at it and tell us maybe what we were doing wrong. Um, but really the, 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 the meat of what needs to be done here is implementing those materializations that tell dbt how do you go from a select statement into this sort of item potent, repeatably built table um, and it, we found some areas where that was slow or it didn't work exactly how we wanted it to.